week I have a, a word for you that I really want to share. It's, it's going to start this week and run for the next two Sundays after today, so a total of three. We're going to be diving into the book of Habakkuk. Everybody say Habakkuk. It sounds like you're clearing your throat. Say it again, Habakkuk. Right? If you're Jewish, you got the H in there a little bit too. Habakkuk. All right? We're going to be starting there. But the question I have for you is, have you ever faced a situation and you've prayed about something and didn't see God doing what you'd hoped he was do, going to do for you? And have, has anybody ever faced that in the last year, <laughs> week, <laughs> or in your life in, in any time? Most of us have. And typically the, the question that we'll never admit to but we ask is, God, where are you? You ever ask that question? Where are you, God, in this situation? Where are you in this moment? And I really need you and I'm struggling. Where are you, God? And today I want to, from the book of Habakkuk, deal with that question because we find that. You know, I won't recall the whole story because many of you uh, have heard it. If you haven't and you'd like to hear it, you can go back into the, uh, the sermons on our website there and see it. I believe it's in late February when Teresa and I shared our personal story of, uh, of our journey through chronic pain and, and some other situations that we went through in an auto accident we had years and years ago. And, and uh, you know, I'm not going to recount the whole story, but for those of you who haven't heard it, I'll give you the brief version. And that is, as a result of an auto accident we had, uh, Teresa has struggled with chronic head pain, uh, depression, uh, personality changes, a ton of different things that have gone on in her life, which also affected my life. And so many times over the last 34 years or so, in the midst of that, I've asked that question. Uh, you know, God, why, why aren't you healing Teresa after all this time? God, why aren't you doing that? When is her pain enough? When has she struggled enough with that? God, I've prayed, I've interceded, Lord, I've fasted, I've called on you, and I believed you for a healing. God, where are you in my life? Anybody else ever feel like that in your life about situations that you're going through? We all face them, don't we? Well, Habakkuk, uh, he, he's, he's going to talk to us about that. So I want you to turn there in your Bibles. And if you don't know where Habakkuk is, what you do is you go to Matthew, and then you go backwards about 12 pages, and you'll run into it in there somewhere, okay? So grab your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew, and then start stroking backwards till you see this really weird word that says Habakkuk on it. And that's where we're at. It's only three chapters long, so it's not a long book. It's very short. Habakkuk, while you're turning there and counting those pages, uh, Habakkuk, uh, there's not a lot of information about him. He's one of the prophets. He's one of the minor prophets. There was 12 of them. He's one of them. And, and here's what normally happens. A prophet normally, what a prophet normally does is he speaks to the people on behalf of God. So God gives him a word and he shares it with the people. Sometimes it's not such a great word. Sometimes it's a wonderful word. But Habakkuk's a little different because what he does is he's actually going to God on behalf of the people, and he's, he's trying to get God to see some things that he doesn't think God is seeing. Now, it's, it's an interesting time because it's 600 years before the birth of Christ. And, uh, and so what had been happening during this time was the nation of Judah, God's chosen nation, his people, had really been in a downhill decline at that point. Things had not been going well. Uh, you know, at one point they were very prosperous and the nation was thriving greatly and everything was going great, but now they were impoverished. Now there was injustice within the nation. There was corruption going on within the nation. There was violence within the nation. Does it sound like I'm talking about anything similar, familiar today? <laughs> yeah, kind of crazy, huh? Habakkuk was beside himself. He was confused, he was perplexed, he was baffled, disappointed. He would even say, I would even say he was angry at God in the situation. He's thinking to himself, God, why would you allow all of this on your chosen people? You could stop it at any time, and yet you don't. And I don't understand why. And, and here's the thing. You know, usually when you're going to deal with someone above you, you tend to step into the thing easily and butter them up, right? You, you, you kind of, you know, hey, how you doing? Good to see you, boss, right? 
No, Habakkuk just kind of steps right into the middle of it. He doesn't hold back. He's upset. He's mad. I learned years ago from my dad, who was in ministry for a long time, that, you know what, sometimes I just got to get real with God and just tell him how I feel. And this is a little bit of what Habakkuk was doing right here. So the question that he was asking God 2,600 years ago is really the same question that a lot of us are asking today as well. And that question is this, why doesn't God seem fair? You ever ask that question? It doesn't seem right. Why doesn't it seem fair? And if you look at that, verse 1, uh, we won't even read that one, because in verse 1, he receives a vision. He receives a prophecy, right? And in Hebrew, that, that means that he receives an utterance or a burden or some word of doom is what it's trying to say there. And uh, so we'll skip to verse 2, if you're looking there in your Bibles. Look at verse 2. So he goes on to God, and he asks this. He says, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why? Why do you tolerate such wrongdoing? And for me, through the years, I would have to say, I've asked God, God, why don't you heal my wife? Why don't you make it right in her? Maybe in your life it's something else, and you've asked God that same exact question. But here we have Habakkuk asking this about his nation. He doesn't get it. He knows that God could intervene, and yet God doesn't. And we have to appreciate the brutal honesty that he puts out here, don't you think? You ever felt that way? That just to get really honest? It's interesting because his name really tells a story, is really what it is. Because the name Habakkuk actually means to embrace or to wrestle. To embrace or to wrestle. And Habakkuk is doing everything he can to embrace God in his writings. And what he knows of, God, of who God is but because what he sees for real in the lives of the people in the nation doesn't line up with what he knows and who he knows God as and what he believes who God is, he wrestles with God. So he embraces the greatness of God and yet wrestles with the injustices that he sees. Do you see that there? Have you ever felt like him? You ever felt like that in your life? You've asked the question. Maybe your question went like this. Maybe your question said, why can't we have a baby? Maybe your question was, what happened to my marriage, God? Why did I get laid off? Why am I alone? Why did my cancer come back, Lord? Where were you, God, when I was being abused? Why can't I seem to get ahead in life, God? Why have my kids walked away from their faith? And over and over, we ask these questions of God because what we know of God, what we understand of God, it doesn't seem to line up with the stuff that goes on in our lives. And it's getting really quiet in here, which tells me I'm kind of hitting some nails on the head. It's okay to shout out an amen every now and then if you're feeling like I'm right where you are. And as we wrestle with God, have you ever had a well-meaning believer of Jesus Christ come alongside of you and give you those words of encouragement that you don't want to hear like, brother, God is in control. Y'all knew that, right? Or just let go and let God. Right? You've heard that one. I just heard that snicker. Or... How about let go? You said just hold on and just let go. Now I don't get it. Let God. Here's, here's one that really ruffles my feathers. I've heard this one. Well, you must have some unconfessed sin in your life, brother, if you're not being healed. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You know, it's moments like that and, and, and that they come to encourage you. And in in, in those moments, I just want to really embrace Scripture and I want to do what Scripture says when it says, lay hands on them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Anybody else feeling a little like me in those moments? Amen. What they say may be true, 
But what your faith, with your faith rattled, and in those moments when you're spiritually shaken and you're hurt, and you're asking God, why do you let this happen to me? Why don't you do something? God, just do anything. Where are you? It's not fair. In those moments, those are not the words we really want to hear, are they? We want God to respond. And here's what Habakkuk asked the Lord, if we skip to verse 3. He says, why do you make me look at injustice? And why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict that abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. In other words, here's what he's saying. I don't think you're doing what is right, God. I got a plan and you need to hang on and listen to me. See, God, uh, Habakkuk has a few problems with God in this moment, and maybe they're the same problems you have. He has some of the same things that we think and we deal with. Uh, he's got three problems. Let me share those with you. The number one problem that, that he seems to have with God is this, is that you don't seem to really care, right? Oh, come on. We know he cares, but how many of you would agree? Let's be real. How many of you would agree? Sometimes it just doesn't feel like God really cares about what I'm going through, right? How could he allow this injustice? How could he allow this suffering? How could he allow what's going on in my life? Sometimes it just doesn't feel like he really cares. The second thing that Habakkuk is feeling that we probably feel today is, you aren't doing much when I know you could. Have you been there? I know you. I've been there. Come on, I just said it. I know you can heal my wife, God. I know you could do this. Why are you not? You, are doing, you could be doing so much when you're, when you're not, and I don't get it, God. And the third thing, and this is, this is not one of your feel-good messages, is it? This, this one deals with, uh, you okay? is it okay with being real? I mean, we, we, could, we could be fake and put on a facade, but let's be real in our struggles. You know, Many of you don't realize the phone calls that I get or the inboxes that I get of people who are, are really in struggles. And, and bless their heart, they come in and they put on the, the, the nice face because they don't want folks to know. But there's a lot of struggles going on. Let's get real in where we're at in our walks with God and what's happening around us. Amen? Amen. The third thing is, is, God, what are you doing this doesn't seem fair. What are you doing? It just doesn't seem fair to be going through this. You ever felt like that? God, if I were you, I'd be doing some things differently. Lord, check, check it out. Listen, I got a few things for you. Maybe you and I could talk a little bit. I have a few suggestions for you. You ever been there? So here's the great question, all right? Here it is. It, 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 it's, is it ever okay to question God? And the answer is yes. And you're like, oh. questioning God does not threaten who he is. Let me tell you that right now, because he is God. Questioning God is just a way for you to struggle and work through what you're going through. Questioning brings better understanding. And, and you know what? If we look in Scripture, we see a third, a third of the Psalms are, are prayers or songs about people who are hurting with questions to God. Several of the books in the Bible, complete books like the authors of Job and Lamentations and Ecclesiastes and Jeremiah, express confusion and pain of unbearable suffering by faithful believers who are still questioning God. Even Jesus himself, when he was hanging on the cross, and he felt the Lord turn his back on him and looked away. And Jesus said, why? Why? Sometimes we feel that way, don't we? You know, in our lives, we, we look for certain things, and we experience certain things in our walks with God, right? And, and here's, here's what I would say is a normal, somewhat normal believer's experience in God, okay? Check this out. I, I, I drew some diagrams. You're going to love this. This is really great. Um, the first is, is we actually have an encounter with God, a moment with God. It happens in our lives, boom. We have a moment when us and God connect, and it's like, oh, my God. Uh, well, yeah, basically it is. He's, oh, my God. And we have that moment when we come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ in our lives, right? You've all experienced that yet? Okay, three of us have, fantastic. The rest of you will be giving an altar call at the end for salvation. Hopefully you'll join us in the fellowship with Christ. Um, we have that moment, and in that moment, it's an ex 
amazing, expressive thing that God does in our lives. And instantly, we begin to have this mountaintop experience. Many of you will remember it, right? It's like instantly, we, we go right into this moment where every song was sung just for us. Every scripture that we read was like God was speaking directly to us. Every word that was given was like, wow, I so needed to hear that. Y'all been there? You know what I'm talking about, right? Every prayer that was prayed was exactly what you needed to have prayed over you. Anybody ever been there? The mountaintop is a great place to be, isn't it? We would love to live on that mountaintop, wouldn't we? But does that happen? Is that very real to live on a mountaintop like that spiritually? No, it's not. Because what happens is we run into a crisis moment in our lives, right? We run into a crisis moment, and what happens in those crisis moments is one of two things. When we hit that moment and we come off of that mountaintop experience with God, and the crisis hits, we're going to do one of two things in our lives, and you're going to say, mm, yep, that was me, on one of probably the two of these. The first was, you're going to deny that the problems actually exist. You're going to be, nope, nope, that one's not real in my life, I, you know, I, mm, 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 and you're going to reach back to that mountaintop, claiming that I'm there, even though you know the crisis has hit in your life. Okay, that's the first thing that many Christians will tend to do. The second thing that most Christians will tend to do is they will either deny and, and try to live on the mountaintop, or they'll, on the opposite end of that, they will actually get to that point to where they say, you know what, God's not real, forget it. My, my experience, my encounter with God did not happen, and we begin to turn our backs away from God because we feel like he turned his back away from us. Isn't that pretty much real in a lot of people's lives today? Thank you, thank you. And, you know, we're at that crisis moment, and, and we think there's two options, but there's actually a third option. And, and this is the option that some people take, and this is the option we kind of have to hang on to. This is the option that um, actually um, um, Habakkuk actually hung on to, and, and this is it right here, because what we find is it gets worse. All right? This option of when it gets worse, it actually begins to go further down in our lives, and we kind of hit the bottom, Right? How many of you have ever been there? And we're like, how much worse could this get? I've been there. Mm, how much worse? I, and I should never ask that question. I said that in 2020. How much worse could it get? Mm, I should have never asked that question, right? But this is the moment when we have to realize that, and I'm going to preface where I'm going with the scripture, and that is we've been studying on Wednesday nights in our Bible study the book of James. And James is talking to the believers that have been scattered across the continent, the, the Jewish believers who've come to know Christ, he's talking to them there, and they're facing persecution where they're at, and he's written a letter to them to encourage them. And, and this encouraging letter in James chapter 1, verses 2, 4, here's what we find right there, and that is he says these wonderful words that are just so encouraging to all of us. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. This is a good word. You're going to love this. Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. What? What? You're going to consider that joy? Consider that joy when we face trials of many kinds because you know that, and here's, here's this, this scooping part in our lives right there, you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And you know that perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature. Ooh, that's not a word most of us like to hear. Mature in our faith, so that you may be mature and complete, he says, not lacking anything. So he's telling us we got to go through these trials and consider them joy. Say that with me. Joy. Come on, you at home too. Here we go. Joy. When we go through these things because these things are so important for us that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. And that's where we face it. And we're like, that's it. I'm at the end. What else could this possibly be? Where else could I possibly go with this? 
And here's the thing. Here's what we have to understand, and that is the way to gain intimacy with God is not to try to live on the mountaintop experience. It doesn't work that way. But to walk through the valleys of our lives. Remember in Psalms, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of, I will fear no evil, right? Walking through those valleys is what takes us to a better, mature place in our lives with Christ. See, you got all kinds of questions about God. Your faith may be struggling at times. You have a crisis in your life that you faced, and God responds. He did with Habakkuk. We're going to look there. And, and he responds, and he responds to us. And, and here, is, here is his response, okay? We're going to go to verse 5, if you got your Bibles. Look at verse 5 with me. He says, Look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed. Oh, this is going to be good. Can you wait? God's got a response. Look at the nations, watch, and be amazed at what I'm going to do. Watch this. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if it were told to you. And I'm like, wow, this is going to be something that's pretty good, right? This has got to be pretty good stuff. God's going to amaze these people by what he's going to say. Here we go. You ready? Verse 6. Here is what he's going to do to amaze us. He says, I'm raising up the Babylonians? What? What? These are the bad guys. These are the enemies of Judah. You're going to raise up the bad guys? Can you, can you just see Habakkuk's response to this? Wait, wait, wait. God, I don't think I heard you correctly. You just you, you, you say babies? And he's like, no, Babylonians. Babe? No. The, God, you're going to raise them up? Why? That ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize the dwellings that are not their own, they are a feared and dreaded people. They all come intent on violence. Oh my goodness, God, you just said I'm going to be amazed. I'm amazed. Here, here he is telling Habakkuk, look, you know, you think you're struggling now. I got something for you. Hang on, you're going to be amazed by this. Yeah, I've got a whole other nation that's going to come in and just mess you guys up really bad. And you're like, God, really? Really? In the midst of this crisis we're going through? Really, God, now? He's saying, you think it's bad now? Just wait. Because not only is it going to be bad, I'm going to use your enemies. I'm going to use your enemies to come in and mess this stuff up. This makes no sense. This doesn't seem fair. This doesn't seem godlike. This isn't right. And here's what I want you to see. Here's what I want you to get. If you write anything down, write this down. A committed believer can both wrestle with honest questions with God and embrace a genuine faith in God. You can do that. A committed believer can wrestle with honest and genuine questions of God and embrace that genuine faith in God. The two can go together. They do belong together. And here's Habakkuk, and he's struggling. And, and watch what he does, because he's trying to embrace God and how great he is, and yet he's trying to wrestle with God about the injustices that he feels. Watch this. If we go to verse number 12, we look down there. It says, Lord, are, are you not from everlasting? I'm embracing. Oh, you're great, God. Aren't you always around? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. Oh, I'm embracing you. You're amazing. You're amazing. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. Mm, I'm wrestling with you, God. Now I'm just not understanding this. You, my rock, I'm embracing you, uh, have ordained them to punish. Ooh, I'm wrestling, God. I'm really not happy with this. In verse 13, he says, your eyes are too pure to look upon evil. I'm embracing you. I love you. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. I'm embracing you. You're amazing, God. Why then do you tolerate treacherous, treacherousness? Why? He's wrestling back again with God. He's, he's, he's having a hard time with the understanding of this. Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves. I'm still wrestling. I'm still wrestling with this. God, it doesn't seem right. 
Here Habakkuk is wrestling and he's embracing and he's, he's wrestling and he's embracing and he's trying to understand God. Do you see that? Do you ever feel that way in your life? Like, like sometimes you're questioning and you're loving and, or do you just question and walk away? God wants us to question and love and embrace and question. There's nothing wrong with that. And many of you are right there right now in your life in many different ways, depending on what's going on with you. And what I want you to understand is that God understands your pain. God understands what you're going through right now. He gets it, and he welcomes your questions. Rather than, he'd rather you yell at him and embrace him than to walk away from him. And this is a really different message, I know. And you've got to hang with me on this one, because I know many of you are right there in your life. You're right there in those moments. And when you hit the wall, when the crisis comes, when you're climbing up that mountain, the trial is so hard in your life and you're feeling the burden and you're feeling the doom of what's going on in your life. When you're there, don't deny your doubts, but wrestle with God. Let your doubts drive you to God so that he can begin to work you through them. And even as you wrestle with him, you have to understand he is there to love on you and to help bring revelation and understanding through your struggle. This is really hard for most people to understand. And, and this, quite honestly, is where I have been in my life off and on through the years regarding God and my wife's, our accident that has affected my wife. And as I work and I wrestle with some of those questions at times and I embrace God and understanding why my wife hasn't been healed and why her life was flipped upside down in so many different ways with chronic pain all those years ago. While I'm doing that, I'm wrestling with those questions, and yet I still I embrace God because I know that he has a plan that I don't understand. A quote from a book I'm reading right now says this. What if honestly acknowledging your doubts is the first step toward building a deeper faith? What if embracing your secret questions opens the door for a maturing knowledge of God's character? What if drawing closer to God, developing genuine intimacy with God, requires you to bear that which feels unbearable? to hear him through the ominous utterance, to trust him in the moment of doom, to embrace his strength when you are weak with a burden. What if it takes real pain to experience deep, abiding hope in a God who loves you? Honestly, honestly, getting real, I expected a miracle. I expected God to do a miracle in, in my wife's life. I honestly did. I expected a release from the pain. I, I re expected that, that she was going to be free from that, and we were going to be able to go on and, and not have to look back at that ever again. Someday write a book about the journey of my wife and, you know, whatever. I thought, I honestly believed that God was going to heal her, and he never did. We never saw the healing. I wrestled with God. I've embraced with God, and I've wrestled some more with the questions that I've had about that. And in that time, we did find understanding in the struggle that we've been through, through sharing our story with other people and helping them with their chronic pain and their chronic issues. We did find hope, even in the struggling days. We did find hope in embracing and wrestling with God. We did gain an intimacy with God that only comes through the valleys and through the hard times in our lives. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, we see God moving in and through us. and We never know quite what his moving will, effect will have on our lives, but we know that he's using us in so many ways. And I speak that out over you as well, each and every one of you who facing that struggle. You never understand what God his end result is in your life. You don't quite understand what he's accomplishing or doing, but you have to wrestle and trust and wrestle and trust. And you know, as I've said, I've wrestled for years, but there was one day, one day when I was traveling 
taking the kids to school in the morning, and we had three school drop-offs. We had a middle school, we had a, a, a private school, and we had a high school, so we did three drop-offs. And I was, I was driving with uh, our middle son at that point. We were alone in the car and taking him to school. His name was Caleb. And uh, he was probably in the fourth grade at that point. And uh, Teresa had had a really, really rough morning that morning. And um, rough morning means a variety of different things, and I won't even go into what that means. But it was a very rough morning. And I was feeling really bad for the kids because that's, they never knew the Teresa that I married. The Teresa I married, um, there's been many personality changes over the years through that. And she's not the same gal I married. And I was feeling very bad for them. And I, I was trying to be real reflective with Caleb for a moment. And, and we're driving along. And I looked over and I said, you know, I, I just really feel bad that you never got to know the woman that I married. The Teresa that, I, that I, I fell in love with and married. I said, I love the woman that you know as mom. But I, I just feel bad that you've never known her. Um, the person before the accident. And this little fourth grade kid looks over at me and he says, it, he goes, I don't want to know the woman before because if I didn't know mom how she is today, then I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't have the compassion for people. He has a very compassionate heart, which was born out of watching his mom struggle. And he says, if I didn't know her, then I wouldn't be who I am. And I would, I, I would just, I sat there trying not to bawl my eyes out driving the car because I was just tore up at that point. You know, words of wisdom come in all shapes and forms, don't they? And, uh, and I was just tore up. You know, this is probably the first time I've said that without crying. Normally I'll, I'll start tearing up because it still, still tears me up to think that. And, and yet his words made me realize that God was raising him up to do something that he would not have been able to be equipped to do if it were not for the situation that we've grown up and lived in. And today, that heart of compassion still is within that young man who lives in L.A. He doesn't choose to live in the nice part of L.A. He chooses to live in the, the ghettos of L.A. so that he can live with the very people he works with every single day of the week with the undocumented and with all of the Latino community. He's living right in the middle of it. You know, he could go get a nice apartment, but no, he lives right down in the center of the heart of it. Why? It's that compassion that God birthed in him through the influence of his mom in his life that causes him to make a huge difference in Orange County, California. We never understand or know what God's purposes are. We have to wrestle and embrace and trust that God knows what he's doing because he is God, right? And yet it's hard. Habakkuk embraced and he wrestled. And the promise is in the word that says God's never going to put more upon you than you can bear. But boy, sometimes it sure does feel like it, doesn't it? Sometimes the struggle is real. Just being real with you. I love being real. It's okay. Is it going to get any better? In your life, in my life, it may not. It may get worse. I hate to be real, but let's be real, right? You know, in your life, maybe you're not going to get upgraded on that next flight you take from, uh, from coach to business class. Maybe the flight's going to get canceled and you're going to not be able to do it at all. Maybe in your life, instead of a promotion, you're going to lose your job. Maybe instead of a healing from that physical thing in your life, in your body, you might get sicker. And don't understand it. I don't have answers for you. I don't. I don't. But here's what I want to encourage you to do is to embrace God in the struggle and to wrestle with him with your questions and to embrace him for who he is and for, for who he is as God and what you know of him and then wrestle with him about the points you struggle with and, and question him and let him in the wrestling moments and through the valley teach you and equip you and bring you up onto the other side, understanding greater who he is. Now the good news is, is this is only chapter one of Habakkuk. <laughs> The bad news is, is there's two more to go. <laughs> 
We have no answer. We have no resolution. There's not a miracle happening here. There's no solution. So many people in their walks with God walk away in chapter 1, right? Don't be one of those. So many people in the struggle say, that's it. Serving God was supposed to be easy. This is hard. They walk away in chapter 1. Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is going to be a rough one too. I'm just going to warn you. But when you're in chapter 1, I want to challenge you to wrestle and to embrace. and To wrestle and embrace through the struggles you face. Because I know we all face them. Father, today... This word has been different. This word is not your feel-good word. This is the one that makes us face the reality of where we're at and the struggles that we keep trying to deny we're going through so that, God, we can embrace them fully and become more aware of who you are in our lives and what you're doing. It's not easy, God. It's not easy. But it's real. It's raw. Sometimes, God, it just hurts real bad. Today, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed while we're in this moment, you know, many of you, if you're going to be real and honest, are facing your struggle as well. Maybe you prayed and you didn't get the answer. Maybe you prayed and 2020 was supposed to end and 2021 was supposed to get better, and it didn't. Maybe you've been facing a diagnosis and you haven't seen the healing. Maybe you've had the job loss rather than the promotion. Maybe you lost a loved one. Whatever it is, fill in the blank. And today, you're feeling a little bit like Rebecca, and you need me to pray with you, to encourage you to embrace and wrestle, not walk away. And if that's you today and I can pray a word of encouragement over you, I would love to be able to do that today. And if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to respond to me today. Maybe raise a hand right where you're at so that I can be praying for you. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See that hand. You're right there in the midst of it. The pain is great, and it's hard, and it hurts. It's very real. You don't want to deny it. You really would love some encouragement through it. Because that's the only way that we're going to gain an intimacy with the Father is to go through the valleys that we go through together. Is there others of you that would raise it? Yeah, I see that one back there. Thank you. Is there more? I mean, I know there's more. It's just you actually coming to the point of acknowledging that you're going to wrestle with God. Thank you. Thank you. Back in the back there. Is there others? Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. There are others today. It's real. Very real. Let me pray for you. Father, today today you see these hands God you knew already before they even raised their hands the struggles that they've been facing and Lord in those struggles I pray God that you can help us to come to the understanding that it's okay to wrestle with you about the questions we have you're not afraid of a wrestling match with us and you're not afraid of us questioning why we're doing things you're doing things but God help us to do that and to embrace you at the same time so that God we can continue to love and know you on a more intimate level because the valley is where the roots grow deep on the trees and the valleys we walk through in our own lives is Lord where we can gain roots that grow deep spiritually I pray God that you would begin to encourage and touch each one who lifted the hand up today to know that their struggle's not done, but that you're there and they just need to embrace you in this struggle and trust you to know that you are God and that you see things they don't see, you understand things they don't understand, and that if they can come to that place, 
they will grow in their love with you. I pray that over them today, Lord, in your name. And as you continue with your heads bowed, I just want to ask, is there anyone today that would say, you know what? I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I've never experienced an encounter with God like you mentioned in your message. I never had a moment where I received Christ as my Savior and invited Him into my life. And I need to do that today because there is a void inside of me that is not being filled by anything else that I am trying. And today, Pastor, will you pray with me and help me to know Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior? And if you're in the house or even if you're at home today online, I would ask you that question. If that's you and I could pray with you, I would love to be able to pray with you today. And if that's you, would you just lift a hand up today to say, yeah, that's me today. I would really love to know Jesus in my life today. In this place, anybody at home, take a moment where you're at at home on the couch. Lift your hand up. I see that hand. Thank you. Is there anyone else today that would say, yes, I need that moment to know Christ as my Savior today? If that's you, in this house, I don't ever want anybody to pray alone. So I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. The prayer is just a way to put words to what your heart is trying to express to God. I'm going to invite everybody to say this with you today. Will you repeat it after me? Say, Dear Lord, I give my life to you. I've been doing it on my own, and it's not working. I need you to be in my life, to be my Savior. I confess my sin. I put my belief and hope in you as my Savior. And I invite your Holy Spirit to come into my life. Be a part of all I am. Today I am yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, whether you're at home or you're here in the house, if you prayed that prayer, I really, really ask you, take a moment, fill out that Connect card today, and get it to me so that I can communicate with you on how to walk out your faith in Christ, how to begin to walk in your faith, because a journey like this is, is not an easy one, and we want to be able to encourage you and to walk alongside you. Will you stand with us today in the house as we wrap up? This morning, if you're wrestling with God and you need to spend some time, maybe you just need to come spend some time at the altar today and, and pray and ask Him to help you with the struggle you're facing. Maybe something's going on and you need to just come down and submit it to God today. I'm going to tell you these altars are open as they always are. I'm going to invite you to come today as the worship team sings. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. Let's continue to pray and ask the Lord to do His work.